good morning. Good morning. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Will you stand with me as we sing our call to worship? Holy, holy, holy. First and fourth verses. Well, good morning. good morning. Welcome to Pleasant Hill. Glad you're here this morning, and we're so excited about all that the Lord is doing in our church and in our life. We had wonderful service early this morning. Looking forward to another one uh, just now. So we're glad you're here to worship with us today, and want to welcome our guests and our friends that are with us. Welcome those that are joining us online. Also, we're so glad that you've chosen to be here with us this morning. Uh, we've got a lot of great things that are going on in the life of our church family. Just want to remind you to, to pay attention to the things that are being presented uh, here before you and that are in your uh, bulletin. Make note of those. And also, uh, there have been several that are interested in our women's precept Bible study that's going to begin. That's going to be on Friday mornings at 10 o'clock and uh, beginning here very shortly. So, ladies, if there are any of you that want to be a part of that, please see Miss Julie, myself. We'll get you connected uh, if you'd like to be a part of that as well. Also, coming up very soon, uh, during the 10 o'clock hour prior to this service, uh, we will be launching some brand new uh, Sunday school classes of small groups. We're excited about that for our uh, for our college age, college career age for our young adults, and then also another adult class, and we're going to be revamping some things and uh, with our children and our youth, we're really excited about what the Lord is doing with those um, those opportunities. So, want you to uh, to be a part of that. If you're not part of one of those groups, you need to be. And we'll be sharing more about that here in the next couple of couple of weeks. All right. Again, we're glad you're here this morning. Thankful for you. Uh, uh, also to remind you, uh, there'll be opportunity to give during our worship service or at the end. There are offering plates here uh, that are on the altar. Again, thank you for your faithfulness uh, in so many ways to our church family. Let's take just a moment this morning and we'll uh, continue in our worship with a prayer time. But just before we do, are there any special prayer needs that you'd like to make mention of this morning? Okay. Let's do that, and we'll remember those that are serving us and our military and our first responders, all of those. We're so thankful for them, and uh, many of us have family members that are serving and know people uh, uh, that are in harm's way today. And uh, there's a lot going on that most of us don't know about, and uh, we probably like it that way. So I uh, want to thank, be, uh, be thankful for those that are, that are serving us both home and abroad.
We also want to remember uh, Dwayne Holcomb. He's uh, doing well, but he's in a, uh, the second half of uh, his <coughs> treatment as well, so remember them. And any others? Yes, that's right. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you praise today for uh, loving us with an exceedingly great love. Lord, your love goes on forever uh, with loving kindness that endures forever. You have poured out upon us, and we give you praise for that today. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, today for the presence of your spirit. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for sins forgiven, for hope uh, for heaven that you have brought to each and every one of us, and we give you praise this morning. We lift up those that have been mentioned today before you. And Lord, we know that you work and that you answer prayer as we come before you. And if we follow after you in your ways, Lord, that you minister to our hearts and lives in so many ways, Lord, that we don't even see or know. And we give you praise and glory for those answered prayers. And Lord, we seek, Lord, uh, your presence in the lives of those that have been mentioned today, those that are suffering in body. We know you're the great physician. Lord, those that are suffering with their, and struggling with their future, Lord, we know you hold all things in your hands. And Heavenly Father, those today that are struggling in spirit, Father, we know that, uh, that you can heal every part of us and that you can restore that which has been lost in us uh, through Jesus Christ. And so we, give you, we, give, uh, we call upon you, Lord, to, to minister to us deeply in those, in those ways. And Father, today we lift up those that are gathered here in this place. We just ask, Lord, that you would draw very close and near. May we know your presence. For, Lord, it's in your presence that we find our hope, that our faith is made real, and that we are able to follow after our Father as Christ has done as we follow after Jesus. So we ask you, Lord, to come very near today and pour out your Spirit in this place. We thank you, Lord, for showing us the way through your Spirit and through your Holy Word. And so now, Lord, we ask that you would guide us as we pray in that way in which you've taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. Would you stand with me?
Would you stand with me? I'm so thankful for each and every one of you. What a blessing. Good morning, everyone. We can make our way back to our seats. I said, if we can make our way back to our seats, we have something to say this morning. Come on over here. We just want to let our pastor family know how much we love and appreciate them being here, being here through our transition, being here through our hard time and helping us get to this spot right here, and their love and presence. They're here all the time, and they're with us and they're worshiping with us and they're leading us and guiding us and shepherding us and we surely appreciate it. First of all, let's give our pastor family a hand. And then at the morning service, we gave the pastor family an envelope with half of what we did and the late service, we're gonna give them an envelope with the rest and we're gonna tell them how much we love them. So y'all be sure to hug them today as you leave. This is this pales in comparison to what our heart pours out, and we just really appreciate y'all. Appreciate y'all being here. Appreciate your being here and being active and involved with us. God bless. Thank you, Renee. And we, we do appreciate you. Thanks for all that you do. And just want to let you know, we appreciate the gifts we do. What we really appreciate is you. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate you the way that you serve one another, the way that you serve this community. Uh, we just want to thank you for being you, and it's a, it's a joy and an honor to be able to serve you. Every pastor can't say that, <laughs> and uh, but it is a joy to serve you, and we're so grateful for who you are and for you loving us the way that you have. Thank you for for loving us so well, for embracing uh, Julie and, and Caleb and, and Joshua and Katie when they're here. And, um, and thank you for putting up with me and uh, uh, letting me kind of grow along with you and, and working through some of the uh, rough edges. Thank you so much for loving us. And uh, you're a blessing. And I'm telling you, this is the place to be. And it's because of what the Lord is doing in your lives. And I'm so excited to be to, to be just a, just a part of that. So thank you all so, so very much. This morning we're, we're going to continue uh, as we share together and, and struggle with this, with, with the truth of God's word, that there is a battle raging, but we can win. Amen? We can win that war both without, the Lord has won the war, but that battle within, we can win. It can be won. In us, and this morning specifically, we want to look at again as we work through our the book of Second Peter. We want to look in chapter two towards this passage that speaks to the reality that we can overcome temptation. Do you believe that's possible? We can overcome temptation even more. He empowers us to overcome temptation. Heard story of a uh, of a of a minister that was. On a military base, and he was visiting one of his uh, one of his ministry friends. He was a chaplain on the base, and they were there talking for get together. and And finally, the 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 minister kind of got up the nerve to ask his friend a little bit, and he was he was really curious about it. And he said, "Well, I know here on the military base, he said at least it's kind of got the reputation that that a lot of your a lot of your people or or a lot of your men are into their into their their beer, their women, and their songs." And he said, "How do you fight all the temptation? You're around it all the time." And he says, "Well, that's actually not true." They're really not into their songs. But, um, and, and so, uh, it's okay. Uh, it's a reality that temptation is all around us, is it not? For all of us, we experience temptation. Everywhere we turn, everywhere we look, there are things that if we're not careful, that we can become focused on. And that we can, become, we can be drawn to if we're not seeking after the Lord Jesus Christ. And so right nestled in the middle of 2 Peter chapter 2. Now I would encourage you, uh, but to do so, uh, prepare yourself first. Read the, book, uh, read the ch second chapter of 2 Peter. It's kind of a tough chapter. It's, not, uh, it's, it's kind of a negative Nancy passage, if you would. It, it's, it's, it's got some hard things to say, but it talks about the reality that there are some false prophets 
even within the church. They're in the world, and they're even within the church. I know you don't believe this, but, you know, there are people that don't tell all the truth. And then there are people that don't tell the truth at all. And they even infiltrate and come into the church. Most of the time because of hurts, difficult experiences, but always because they've been lied to as well. But the beauty is nestled right in the middle of that passage, these words. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Amen? Aren't you glad? Aren't you thankful for that? The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. There are false teachers, and they're still telling Satan's old lie. It was from the very beginning in the garden. You remember that? That you can disobey God and surely not die. You remember the lie that was told by the serpent in the garden? Just take a little bite and see that how good it is. And you'll be okay. And then you know what happens is we take a little bit and we, and we get away with this. And, and we get away with maybe the next. And then next thing you know, there we are. And entranced and and experiencing the guilt and the shame and the brokenness and the heartache from working and walking outside of the will of God. But there's good news. God is able to deliver his people from temptation. Amen? Do you believe that? God is able to deliver his people from temptation. Now, very quickly, is the second part of that that we need to note and we need to be mindful of that it goes on in that same verse and completes the thought and says, and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. Here's the other part of that that's a reality we do need to touch upon. That God is able to defeat the enemy of his people. God is able to do that. I'm here to let you know this morning that the part we need to cling to is he's able to deliver you and me from temptation. And it's his business to deal with the other. You see that. God is able to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. He'll deal with those in his time. That's not necessarily for me and for you. Our responsibility is to enjoy the grace that God gives us to escape temptation. We remember the reality that the word of God declares vengeance is mine, says the Lord. God will keep wicked persons reserved for their due punishment. That's not our job. This is not about the false teachers. This is about God's overcoming grace in us. And so we're reminded in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21 where the Bible says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Many will say to me, the Bible says, in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. God will take care of that. That's his job. We're not responsible for that. Our job is to trust him and to be obedient. And so in this we see a couple of things that we can cling to. How is it that we can escape temptation? How is it that we can overcome temptation in our lives? The first is this, that Jesus Christ is our example. Jesus always goes first. We talk about that. And you hear me talk about that a great deal. We must keep Jesus first in his life, in our lives because he always goes first. He is our example. He clearly calls us to take up our cross and follow after him. There is a way that leads to life everlasting. So how do we escape temptation? Follow Jesus. Follow after Jesus. Even Jesus said, it's recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, and verse 30, I can of myself do nothing. Jesus said that. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous. Why? Because I do not seek my own will, but the will of my Father who sent me. As Jesus follows after and accomplishes the will of the Father, we're to seek and to follow after Jesus Christ. And in that, we can overcome temptation. 
There's a second thing that we need to realize. Jesus was tempted. Jesus was tempted. Is there anyone in here that's never tempted? Don't raise your hand because we all know the truth. Amen. Amen. Everyone is tempted. Even Jesus was tempted. Jesus was tempted. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Even the Spirit, he's led. Anybody ever been in the wilderness? Amen. Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Now, I promise not to keep you past 1230 this morning. But... <laughs> Right, 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 right. Any of you get a little testy when you're hungry? Huh? Is that just me? You know, you know, any, uh-oh, people are pointing fingers. Okay, let's, let's, let's move on. Let's move on. But can you imagine? He's in the wilderness. He's alone. He's by himself. He's tired. There's nothing available around him. He's hungry. How many of you know that's when the enemy comes? In those moments of weakness? In those moments of challenge, in those moments of difficulty, in those moments of loneliness and weariness, that's when the enemy comes. And it says that now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command these stones become bread. And he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is written hang on to that then the devil it says took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said if you are the son of god throw yourself down for it is written he shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands they will bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone and jesus said to him it is written again you shall not tempt the lord your god And again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said, the devil, all these things I give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. It's no new story. The devil's been making promises that he can't keep for a long time. He's been setting things out before you and saying, I will do this for you if. And he never holds up his end of the bargain. But notice the last part. Verse 11 says, then the devil left him. (sighs) Then the devil left him. And behold, the angels came and ministered to him. The reality here is Jesus won. Amen. Jesus won. And in him, he has overcome the world. And Christ who is in you has overcome the world. You are overcomers in him. You can win the battle. Even against temptation. So here he is, Jesus, the second person of the Holy Trinity, the only begotten of God, the creator of every living thing, left heaven's glory to come and to suffer for our salvation. Think about it. He was born as a baby on the wrong side of town, if you would, and endured all manner of temptations And trials and struggles, even torture and abandonment. And still obey God the Father. The Spirit led him into the wilderness. A place of loneliness, emptiness, separation, danger, hunger temptation but by focusing on God's word Jesus won Jesus won in the book of James the Bible says this 
Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted, hear this, when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. For some of us, it's time that we quit blaming God for the mess that we're in. No, I'm sure that we didn't choose some of the hard places that we're in today or have been in in life. It's not always of our own doing. But it's not God's will that his people should suffer. But even in the midst of his suffering, if we'll follow Christ and be obedient to his word, we with him can win. The passage goes on, it says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And, to, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. My friends, this is written to the church. Huh? None of us are too grown up in Christ not to be aware of the temptations around us. What is it that comes just before the fall? Pride. Be careful. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or turning, if you would, or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For wrath does not produce righteousness, the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness, what? The implanted word. The implanted word, which is able to save your souls. I don't know about you, but this soul needs some saving. I need God's word all of it all of it i need his word notice what it goes on to say then in the last couple of verses of this passage in james 1 verse 22 it says but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves be careful for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he who observes himself goes away and immediately forgets what manner or what kind of man that he was. Do you not know that you are a child of God, that you are the temple of God, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit? Remember who you are. And he who is overcome is within you. The word says, but he looks... Into the perfect law of liberty. There it is again. And continues in it. And is not a forgetful hearer. But a doer of the word. This one. Will be blessed. In what he does. I. I remember a book that I read as a, as a child, and I, many of probably in, in, in my generation read this book. It was quite popular uh, in a period in the church. Uh, uh, but I read this book as a child, and, and it, was, it was a powerful book, and it had a lot of imagery in it. It was a Christian fiction novel that was written by Paul Bunyan. Any of you ever heard of him? It's an old Christian, uh, if you would, uh, a treasure called Pilgrim's Progress. I don't know if you've ever read that book, or but, but for those of us that were growing up in the church several years ago, most all of the children either heard the story or read the story themselves or young people, and, and, and it had powerful imagery of who God is. I encourage you, if you haven't read, uh, read that book before, to read it. But there was one particular scene that I'm mindful of this morning that the pilgrim himself, he was, he was trying to walk on that path that is, that is straight, that is narrow, that leads to life everlasting, that leads him to the holy city, that leads him to the place of light. And the, the pilgrim, as he was traveling that, that narrow pathway, he approached two ferocious lions, one on either side of the road. 
Of course, he was naturally afraid, but he, he took a few more steps and went on just a little bit further. And as he drew closer to those lions, so, so fearfully drew closer, he noticed that they were on chains, you see. And those lions, as they would try to come and to approach, they could get close to the road and the edge of the road and even onto the road, but they could never get to the center of it. And so we learn that if he walked in the center of the road, that he was able to escape the danger, you see. Let's be honest. Too many of us for too long have seen how close to the edge that we could live and still get away with it. When the call of Scripture Jesus says, come to me. If we'll live as close to Jesus as we can possibly get by his grace, it's not by our abilities or what we do, but it's by his grace and faith in him alone. But as we draw close to him, he helps us to escape the attack of the enemy. There's a story that's told of a, of a missionary who um, had had gone to, to, to visit a certain area of the world that God had called him. And, and as he was there, he was visiting with some of the, the tribesmen from the area. And they were taking him to a remote village to go and minister. And so as they went along their way to the remote village, just before entering into that village, they came to a place where there was a deep chasm. Two, three hundred feet deep it was. And there was no way around it. The only way through was a fallen log over this chasm. As the missionary goes on to, to tell the story, he saw that and, and one of the tribesmen said, the only way there, one of the elders, the only way there is we must cross, walk across this, this log. And so the missionary was looking at this log. It looked wet and slippery and, and he was afraid. Who would it be? And as he looked at that, he, he said, I, I just, I don't know if I can, we can do this. And the tribesman said, don't worry We'll help you. Here's what you have to do. And he said, we'll all line up together to cross this log. And, and the person in front of you, you'll place your right hand on their right shoulder. And the person behind you will place their right hand on your shoulder. And then as you come to your part and you step up onto this log, plant your foot firmly in the log, he said, and you'll see. That your feet, your foot will press down into the moss on the log and that it will push out the water and that it will create a vacuum, a void, a place for your foot so that you can firmly stand. And we'll walk across the log. And then they reminded him the one, the most important thing, whatever you do, no matter whatever you do, you look ahead and only at the back of the head of the one in front of you and look nowhere else. And you'll walk across safely. So he was fearful, but he had no way out, no other alternative. And so he did what he was told to do, placed his hand on the shoulder. He felt the hand on his shoulder. And as his turn came, he stood up onto the log. And it was just as they said, as he pressed firmly down upon the log, he felt the moisture go from underneath his foot. His foot sunk down into the moss on the log. He had a firm place to stand. And then step by step, he walked across the log. And as he went across the log, he began to think, well, this isn't so bad. This isn't so bad at all. We're going to make it just fine. And he, and he couldn't hardly stand it. As he got near the end of the log, he just said, I, I just want to see. I want to look. I want to see. And I, I just, just took one quick look. And he began, as he looked down, had it not been for the quick actions of the tribesmen who grabbed him and pulled him to safety, he would have plunged to his death. You see, this world is increasingly dangerous and full of temptations, amen? It's all around. And our only hope for survival is to keep our eyes firmly focused on the person of Jesus Christ. 
Not to look here and to there and to have our attention drawn to these other things that will never satisfy. But to keep our eyes on Christ. Especially in those most dangerous moments when we find ourselves in the wilderness, tired, alone, hungry, in need. Because only Jesus can get us home. And then as we take that step and follow after Christ, we'll realize that there is one whose hand is upon our shoulder. Amen. As the very spirit and presence of God walks along with us that fills our spirit and helps us to know the way. As he guides us into truth, we can make it home. We can make it home. We can make it home. We need the presence of God in our lives if we're to make it. But we can by his grace. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, amen, but to trust and obey. I'm so thankful that I walk alongside brothers and sisters in Christ that have a hand on my shoulder upon whom I can put my hand when times get treacherous, we need one another, amen? Why? Because Christ lives in us. And it's through those appropriate and loving touches that the presence of God comes so many times. So when you find yourselves in those moments, don't walk alone. Don't walk alone. Call out to the Lord and call out to his people. He is near. Even in the wilderness. And follow Jesus. You'll win. If you follow Jesus. In just a moment we're going to. To worship. Together as we share in. The Lord's Supper. And I'm mindful as we do that. As we're reminded. First and foremost of what Christ has done for us. We're also reminded of who we are in Jesus. We are the body of Christ. Did you know that? Just as we look upon this bread as it is broken, we are reminded that the body of Christ was broken for us. But Jesus says, take up your cross and follow after me. He's called upon me and you to offer up ourselves as a gift to the Lord for the blessing of others. I hope and pray this morning as we come to this table and all are invited to come. You should, only, you should only need to confess that you are in need of Christ to forgive you for your sins, to cleanse you from your sinfulness, and to be the Lord and Master of your life. You are welcome to come and to receive from Him. It's not about membership in Pleasant Hill. It's about membership in the family of God. Amen. You're invited to come. And so this morning, you're invited to come and receive from him. Paul wrote to the church in 1 Corinthians these words. For I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This morning, as you receive the bread... And as you come, that bread will be given to you, will be placed in your hand. As you receive that bread, remember how much Jesus loves you. That the Father bankrupted heaven and sent his only begotten Son as a sacrifice that through his stripes, his brokenness, you would be healed. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. What is that covenant? I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will dwell in your midst. We need the presence of God in our lives, amen? That's the promise. The new covenant in his blood. And so this do as often as you drink it 
and remember me. So in this we remember God's promise through the shed blood of Jesus, through that which is in the cup. It represents the reality, as the Hebrew writer said, the life is in the blood. Amen. The life is in the blood. The blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. There's power in the blood to overcome. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I'd like to invite those this morning that are going to be serving and assisting today to come and together here at the altar and you'll be served first. And then after these are served, we'll be inviting you to come uh, as you will to receive from the Lord.